Hello, people. You are free. By no other standard, uh, you are free. It, uh, most people have a, an opinion, a uh, view of the world that uh, the freedom that we have is false. Well, that's true. Uh, the freedom that we are given and provided is false. The freedom that is real is the freedom we take. And uh, that's the only way we're ever going to have it, is if we take it. Or stand up for our rights and demand them. And that is the method by which uh, freedom is taken. So we're here today to do another show on, we're going to talk about the Constitution again, because the Constitution is such an important um, thing to have an understanding of to find out where your rights are coming from. And so here, this is, once again, we're going to show the Constitution of California, and this is available for free from your Assemblywoman, Noreen Evans, here in Santa Rosa if you're a resident of Santa Rosa. And um, in it, we see where the law for California comes from. It comes originally from the Magna Carta in 1215. And the Magna Carta is the starting point of a definition of what was called English common law. English common law is basically the law that uh, you know is stated in almost every single religion in the world as do unto others as you'd have others do unto you. It's an idea of reciprocity. We don't want to be treated badly, and so we can't treat others badly. If you do treat somebody else badly, we're going to call that a trespass. You've trespassed upon them. Nowadays, people only think of trespass in relation to stepping on somebody's land. In that case, you're trespassing on their property rights. But in the true um, sense of the word, trespass is any time somebody has physically demeaned your rights or your person. Injury to self, to body, to property, to contract. And there was about a dozen different common law actions that one could take, but most of them dealt with um, your property rights and the retaining of your property rights. Oh, here, okay, and highlighted in yellow you can read, On April 13th, 1850, Statute 1850, Chapter 95, was passed by the newly formed uh, legislature of California of 1849. California became a state in 1849, and it became a republic. And this was the law of the land. Quote, the common law of England, so far as it is not repugnant to or inconsistent with the Constitution of the United States or the Constitution or laws of the state of California, shall be the rule of decision in all the courts of this state. And then after that, they repealed all the previous laws because the owners of the, pro of the land bef in California before um, the uh, Americans came was Spain and Spain had a different form of law they had a civil law like Roman civil law going on here and so when this uh, state became a country in 1849 they repealed all of the previous acts after they adopted this and then they grandfathered in anybody that had contracts that were pre-existing would be allowed to enforce their contracts of course so anyway the common law of England is the law of the land. That's all you need is one law. You don't need a book uh, tw 20 inches thick full of all different codes and all different ordinances and all that. That doesn't apply. The common law of England is very simple. I mean, I guess it can have some complexity, but basically anybody who feels that they've been injured can take the person who they feel has injured them to court. And of course, that's not going to happen very often because you're not going to get you know, you're not going to get what you want very often from that. Depending because on how you handle it. the tribunal that decides mm -hmm. whether the other person is judged guilty or not is not the judge. And it's not the rules of the state, such as the codes. The tribunal is the 12 jurors that are the people of the state. If you, you present your case and you go, hey, John Doe over there smacked me on the head with a shovel and I have a witness to it, Mary Beth saw him do it, and then the sheriff can round up John Doe and bring him to court. And John Doe will have to answer to a jury of 12, and the jury of 12 will decide whether John Doe had a good reason for smacking you on the head with a shovel, whether John Doe actually did smack you on the head, 
And yeah, there'll be discovery, evidence entered, witnesses, and there's, et cetera. Yeah, there's no rules in court. You just show up and tell your story, which is completely different from the way it is today, where you go into court and immediately the uh, opposition, the prosecutor or the attorney for the other side will go, objection, hearsay evidence, objection, he's leading the witness, objection, 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 objection. It's like they spend all their time trying to get this, not get the story read into the record. Uh, in England, William Pitt summarized the concept of private property under common law as follows. The poorest man may in his cottage bid defiance to all the forces of the crown. In this case, the federal government or a state government. Or the local police. Exactly. Your county government, your community government. The sheriff. Mm -hmm. They can't be invading your home the way they do. And we all know they do. They, they violate your rights and violate the law every day. Uh, it may be frail. Its roof may shake. The wind may blow through it. The storms may enter. The rain may enter. But the king of England cannot enter. All his forces dare not cross the threshold of the ruined tenement. And that's if you, now they use that as an example to explain that, yeah, even if you're poor and downtrodden and your place is falling apart, it's still your place. That dirt and that shack is your castle and it can't be invaded. As a result of all this, the common law of the states is founded and grounded upon substantive titles in real property. So anyway, Let, let's discuss first, one has to understand the lawful elements of a contract. Now these only apply if you're in common law. If you're not in common law and you're not a, you're not one of the people and you're a 14th Amendment citizen of the United States, then as a 14th Amendment citizen, and we are going to read the 14th Amendments later so you can understand it, oh, yeah. you are subject <laughs> to the jurisdiction of the government. And if you're subject, that means they have control over you. So if they have control over you, they can pretty much write whatever legislation they want, and you are going to be subject to that. But That's if you're, called color of law. But if you're not subject to the jurisdiction of the government, and you, you claim that you are one of the people, and basically sovereign, then you have all of your constitutional rights if you claim them. If you don't claim them, then you don't have them. So you have a situation where you have your it's your responsibility and it's your duty to know what your rights are you know at the time of the revolution in the seven in the late 1700s i've read that 90 95 percent of the households had books on law in them and i'll a, guarantee you at least 100 <laughs> percent a very knowledgeable group of people lived in this country and, and, they, this, and they all had guns at this point how many people are knowledgeable about their rights and the law? Constitution. <laughs> so, amendments to the Constitution of the United States of America. Amendment 1. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. And if you pay close attention today, what goes on, there's, uh, you know, um, what do you call it, these uh, free speech zones popping up everywhere uh, where local law enforcement uh, claiming to have authority come and tell you you have to go over here where no one can see you and no one can see your protest, no one can see your redress of grievances that you're asking for. Well, and you have a right to assemble. Exactly. It says right there. It doesn't say you have a privilege to You've assemble. You've got a right to speak freely. I mean, if you go out, you try it. You take something that you feel very passionate and that's very important that regards politics or, or whatever, and you go out on a corner and start yelling and hollering about it, and you'll get uh, disturbing the peace, blah, 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 and then you start telling the cops, oh yeah, it's my First Amendment right, this and that. Oh, maybe, maybe they'll slap a, uh, what do you call it, it's interfering uh, with a police obstruction. investigation, obstruction, all this other, and that's all color of law crap, doesn't apply to you anyway, but you don't know that, so they slap it on you, you go to the no, court, the judge that. takes all your rights away. and Worse than that, they don't know that. They don't know that the penal code, the civil code, 
doesn't apply to you if you are a free man. Which is just one of the people of the Republic of California, which we all are, but that... But you have to claim it. Yeah, that's right. And that means, basically, for the most part, you just have to say so. So, Amendment 2. Well, let's, let's stick with the First Amendment. Okay. Because <laughs> we have the right to freedom of the press. In addition to that, what's freedom of the press? I mean, do you know that Erwin Schiff wrote a book called uh, The Federal Mafia, where he made a very good detailed explanation of why the income tax did not apply to anyone. And the federal government came in and confiscated all his books, took the money out of his bank account, and stated that he was in violation of a law that stated he couldn't have, he couldn't do commercial speech. <laughs> now where do they get the right to abrogate his constitutional rights I mean, freedom of the press means you can pretty much state whatever you want to in, in, in word form. And to, to understand why that is important here is because how can a book with words printed in it physically trespass or harm an individual? Is that possible? Can you have your rights violated in the form of a book? You can be slandered. Somebody can falsely accuse you. But you can't be physically abused and lose, lose any rights by, some, by whatever somebody prints in a book. So mm -hmm. that's an impossibility to be trespassed upon, you know, other than you could take somebody to court for slander, for lying. Well, the federal government abuses uh, more than just people. They abuse ideas. And one of the ideas they abuse is in the Constitution called the Commerce Clause which the federal government likes to claim allows them to basically control everything. They just call everything commerce. You woke up out of bed and took a shower and drank some coffee. That was all commerce. No, it wasn't. But they like to call every action that you do commerce so they can control everything because they're control freaks. Well, the key words there are they have <laughs> Sorry, the right to control it. interstate commerce. Right. They don't have the right to control commerce, commerce in they have, general. They have the right to control interstate commerce. So and even words, those controls are limited. If you sell alcohol or marijuana to somebody in the state, is that interstate commerce? No. If you, if you mailed marijuana or alcohol or whatever you mailed, as Tobacco. long as you, as you, if you were getting paid for it and you mailed it to somebody in another state, that is interstate commerce. Because and they have the right to tax that. Because you are getting paid for it. But the people who have the right to tax it are the Treasury Department, not the IRS. So then let's look in amendment number one at the bottom where it says, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now that is a right. Not a privilege, it's a right. And that petition, if you went to file it, they would say, I'm not filing We, we don't have to answer it. Yeah. And we don't have to answer it as well. That's right. We had um, uh, Bob Schultz of We the People, who is a tax advocate guy, take a, a, sue the federal government in the Supreme Court, or not Supreme Court, I think it was District Court, and the judge actually stated that even though he had a First Amendment right to petition the government, what he was doing was he was asking the government to show him a law that required the average citizen who labored to pay a tax on his labor. That was the petition. That The grievance was that they are taxing people without any lawful cause. And the judge actually stated to him that even though he had a First Amendment right, the government did not have to respond to him. So we can see how far we've come to a tyrannical dictatorship when the government doesn't honor the Constitution, which is basically the fence around the crop or the, the area that, that the um, contract that defines the government. The and their powers and authorities and uh, how far they can uh, go and how far they can't go and what authority and power they don't have. The Constitution is stated to be the supreme law of the land. The supreme law of the land. Nothing is above the Constitution. Another thing they like to use is this, uh, what's in the Constitution about uh, treaties. The Constitution 
respects treaties on high, in some cases above itself, but nothing that is unconstitutional. If a treaty comes about that is agreed to, that abridges the Constitution or abrogates rights, etc., that are constitutional, well, that's repugnant to the Constitution, hence is not respected uh, in that constitutional... Um, and is uh, void ab initio back to the beginning, as if it was never passed. But the federal government likes to trick it up, you know. Oh, we have a treaty, you know, that says this uh, authoritarian uh, system is, uh, you know, our can, right can to... Can be bypassed. You know, sure, you know. It's really, really nasty. Uh, but the thing is, it's like it's like a kid in a schoolyard pulling his pants down and showing his, his, his rear to everyone. That's pretty much what you've got today. Uh, with, uh, I'm sure most of you out there are uh, familiar with recently McChrystal, uh, General McChrystal was fired, uh, forced to resign, whatever, by Obama. And then uh, this, you know, General Petraeus is supposed to take over in Afghanistan. And what did we see with Obama? He stood there and made a speech. We will stay the course. We will not give up in Afghanistan. We will hunt down the enemy. He's, it was George Bush's speech. <laughs> He just stood there and made George Bush's speech. He's not bringing any troops home. The war is valid, which it's not, but this is, you know, all the things they're saying now. These people, they're the same. They're the same. There's no difference, you know. And, and, and uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, uh, uh, Condoleezza and uh, uh, Obama are old white males. <laughs> so let's go to the Second Amendment. Yes, so, for and on the record, <laughs> ah, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That does not mean hunting, that, do, that uh, does not mean uh, a bear can carry arms. Uh, <laughs> uh, what that means is the rights of the people to keep for their property and, and to bear out in the open to carry around with them. Look, I, look what I have. You know, if you want to walk down the street with an M16. That's bearing arms. That's bearing arms. And, and there's nothing wrong with it. And you have these people who, oh, oh, oh my God, you see he's carrying a gun. Whoa. We don't do that. Well, we <laughs> We do that more and more now when we see police. You know, we're supposed to look at police and feel secure. You know, oh, there's the, there's the officer. I feel so good he's there. He's going to protect me if something bad happens. But and most people don't have that opinion of policemen. But that's because that's only because they haven't had an encounter with a policeman who has been extremely over the top in trying to control them. Well, the, yes, we have free the, Sheriff know. Mac videos for any policeman who would like to watch. Yeah, Sheriff Mac of Arizona. The other thing that the right to bear arms has in it is it says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. It does not say that you have to be a member of a well-regulated militia to keep and bear arms. That's right. The reason the Second Amendment is second on the list, right behind the freedom to speak, is that if you don't have a gun and somebody else that you're having an argument does, there is no equality going on. The person with the gun is in the superior position and can force the person without the gun to his will. What did Jefferson say? Those who have beaten their plowshares and their guns into plowshares will plow for those who haven't. <laughs> it's a very wise statement. And you very are true. We're all equal under the law, but those with guns are definitely more equal than those without guns. Now, violence is a last-ditch effort. Not for some. So, you know, you are, the pen is mightier than the sword. And as long, the as, as long as the sword is not brought in, into play, the pen has power. But the minute the other side brings the sword out, then the pen is not mightier than the sword. So the Second Amendment was a very, very important amendment to the Founding Fathers. And they believed that if they had, if, you know, King George had taken away their right to possess arms. Well, of course, a tyrannical dictatorship is going to do that because in the last hundred years in this world, in this century, over 170 million people 
have been killed by their own governments. Yeah, the state is the uh, the uh, Lar- main reason uh, for uh, death <laughs> of, the, of the people. Yeah, there's there's nothing that uh, no it, disease or car accidents or chemical that kills people more than uh, the state. If you want to see some very good information on this, go to Jews for the Preservation of Firearm Ownership, JFPO. And they have a movie called Innocence Betrayed. And they, it's a documentary and they go through it as, you know, the fact is, is that in every single case where the government has killed large amounts of its own people, the first thing they did was gun registration and the second thing they did was gun confiscation. They want you to register your gun so they know where to come to take it. And Germany and Russia are good examples of recent history where it was actually done. And you'll, you'll see time and time again that there has always been a big push for registration of firearms because the police want to know and the government wants to know where they can go to collect all the weapons. On to the Third Amendment. No soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner. Consent, folks. Nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. So the reason I felt it important to mention the Third Amendment and read it here today is because there have been occasions of acquaintances and people that I've interviewed and spoke with uh, who've had um, officers in their homes where they are uh, contesting that the officers are there uh, unlawfully stating, you know, you have no warrant, et cetera, et cetera. You know, this is my property and you're on my property unlawfully. And upon making that statement, officers in kind uh, responding, this isn't your property right now. You know, and there's case after case. All you have to do is go to YouTube and, and type it up. Uh, there's case after case of people with, uh, you know, sheriff's department, police department, F- Homeland FBI, Homeland Security, home, yeah, in their homes. The federal government, and they real. whip out a video camera and point it at them, and get handcuffed and arrested for whipping out a camera, a video camera in their own home, and pointing it at the officers. Now, I do not want to inspire any fear in anybody watching this broadcast. <clears throat> you need to stand up for your rights. If somebody does come in your home unlawfully wearing a badge, claiming authority, you need to whip out that video camera, no matter what the end result is going to be. You know, because the more we lay down and allow these things to continue, the more they're going to continue, the worse they're going to get. It just encourages their bad behavior. It- so let's read the Fourth Amendment. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Now, the most important part of this is supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing. The reason that, in my view, is the most important is because, uh, you know, these days, they say they have probable cause because they smelled weed in the air, you know, or uh, he didn't want to let me search him and so I was suspicious and that gave me probable cause. Probable cause is not just something you can say I was suspicious and that gave me probable cause. Probable cause to search you or your home, to seize you or your house's papers and effects and property has to be supported by an oath or affirmation particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Very important. Okay, one thing, let's let's start at the beginning. The right of the people to be secure in their persons. Who's got the right? The The people. people. Does it say the right of the citizens? It doesn't say the right of the citizens. Does it say the right of the residents? So (laughs) you have to decide right off the bat, are you a people? one of the people, or are you a citizen of the United States? Because if you're a citizen of the United States, none of these constitutional rights apply to you. As a citizen, um, you have duties. You have privileges, duties and privileges. The, the idea of citizenship is one that was developed in Rome, and probably before that, Greece, 
but the citizen has duties and privileges. The duties are to the leaders. The privilege is not to, to sign up and be a, a cannon fodder in their wars. A citizen had the right to avoid uh, duty in the, as a troop, as one of the troops, and, but, and had the privilege of not serving in the war. But, it, but they had the duty to pay taxes and support the government. So there's a big difference between citizen and people. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects. And also people is singular, peoples is plural. No, actually people is singular and plural. Well, yeah, I, I know, it can be used as both, but... So you are a people terms. and you're one of the people. Right. So then houses, papers, and effects. What do you think about all the searches of your emails? Isn't that your personal effects? Isn't that your private matter? It most certainly is. The Echelon system uh, harvests in a program called Carnivore and there are many others. Uh, all of the information, your phone calls, your emails, um, you know. Public uh, records. Public records, uh, which we guys would call private records. FBI um, files, mm -hmm. everything is available to them. Everything, your medical files, your financial history, uh, who your kindergarten teacher was, the food you eat, the movies you rent, uh, you know the, the you know how you go to Safeway these days and you get a little uh, discount card. Well, I talked to the Safeway management and they did tell me that I could uh, there was some information I could leave out if I wanted to get myself a new Safeway card that wasn't attached to my name, which I thought was very nice because there is a program in pen to paper and it is part of the Patriot Act. It's they claim it's part of national security to know what everybody's consuming. So they uh, keep uh, a record, it's a computerized record. It's not like there's somebody in a dark room somewhere um, you know, keeping these records. It's a computer and it logs everything you purchase. Yep, the computer is the sat satanic force being used to regulate everybody. Absolutely. So the people have this right, citizens don't against unreasonable searches and seizures. Now let's also define that citizens are government employees. So we have a right as the people to search their records and documents to ensure that rights aren't being infringed and government is doing what it needs to be doing and not going outside of its authority. Federal government that has jurisdiction only over Washington DC can write any policy it wants to have uh, jurisdiction over its employees or people that are within its jurisdiction. And today, you'll see what's really interesting. You'll watch a movie, and the movie will say at the beginning, this movie is available in your territory. What the hell is a territory? Well, a territory is something that the federal government has jurisdiction over. Puerto Rico is a territory. The Virgin Islands are a territory. These are territories basically owned by the government. And Guam, if, American Samoa, and the Virgin Islands. And if your territory is under the control of the, of the government, then, then they have the right to, uh, they have the right, <laughs> and they have the right to uh, control what goes on in your territory. And so they're going to call what you have going on where you live as a territory. That way they have control over it. Your zip code puts you in a government territory. That's what its whole design is, is to call you a resident of a territory. We might have thought growing up, because we were never taught this stuff, that a zip code, well, what does that define? Well, it just helps them... Uh, uh, be able to organize the, uh, the mail system, you know, so they can, we can send each other mail more conveniently and easily. And that is, is not the purpose uh, of the design of uh, the zip code, as Jeff no, the saying. No, the purpose of the zip code and the, and the mail system is to call you a resident of a territory of the United States. And the United States is a corporation, as we've discussed on our, a lot of our shows, and that corporation would like to say that it has jurisdiction over you. And if you stand up and go, hey, I'm a United States citizen, you just stated that you were under their control. A subject. A subject of their control. So any laws, any regulations that they wrote, they uh, are able to apply them to you because you give up your own personal power, your own personal rights. You give it up. You give up your rights and say, you know, uh, I'm under your jurisdiction. Now the tacit thing here is, 
they don't explain this to you. So most of us are, you know, walking around going, how the hell are they doing this to me? How are they getting away with this? Let's you go know? back to the contract. There's no meeting of the minds. You didn't understand that there was a difference between being one of the people and being a United States citizen, and they didn't explain that to you. You were never given full disclosure. So against unreasonable searches and seizures, what about the Patriot Act? They have a right now, they have declared they have the right to come into your home, plant bugs, read your computer stuff, and never even tell you that they were there. Who can they pass laws like this for? Citizens of the United States. Their employees. Their employees. Their subjects. Their subjects. But if you're not one, then they can't come into your house. Shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation. The oath and affirmation is what we have today. The remnants of that is what you would call a charging instrument. When you go to court, you can demand to see the charging instrument. The charging instrument has to be the sheriff or the police officer or somebody put an oath, I swear the or affirm the following is true. I witnessed so-and-so, John Doe, violate penal code, vehicle code, whatever code it is that they're charging you with on such and such a date. And then he signs his name to it. If you don't have a signed charging instrument, they cannot proceed. Not just that, but the, as you uh, described, it had to, you know, that the charging instrument has codes. Again, those codes don't apply to you. So really what a, a valid charging instrument is, is a signed complaint that from, from states, another one of the people, your exactly, neighbor. Exactly. It has to state an injury or a trespass of some kind. Yep. There has to be uh, theft of property, damage of property, or Deni physical harm to you. Denial of your rights. Denial of your rights. Exactly. That's a trespass. So unless they can, uh, uh, unless they can have those on the document, it's not a valid charging instrument. So every arraignment that is happening across the country. Uh, like what? Good pro I mean, this is just a spitball, but like 90% of the arraignments across the nation are well, probably more than that are all a victimless crimes where no trespass upon anybody's rights are stated. They're null and void, and there's a, you know, America's becoming the largest prison camp on the planet. We've got seven, can, can you violate, seven million plus people in, in prison. Can you violate the rights of the state of California? No, the state of California has no rights unless it's talking about some kind of contract that it has engaged in with another state or another country. Then it would have rights. But the state of California has no rights to be violated. Its sole purpose is the protection of the people's rights. When it's de jour. So we go back to describing the person the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized now most people get arrested without any a warrant that's there right. is no warrant that's issued this the policeman arrests you on the spot with no warrant there's no grand jury indictment there's no facts that are brought to bear and then we have a situation where you're taken off to jail and you don't and you are punished without being proven guilty first. Yeah, you're thrown in a cell that's... Uh, the Constitution is superior to any legislated act. In other words, any act that Congress passes or any act that the state passes is going to be inferior. And if there's a discrepancy between the Constitution and those acts, the Constitution is superior and is the rule. Anything repugnant to the Constitution is void. You're not supposed to be arrested, period, unless there's an, a warrant for your arrest. And that is generally in a criminal action created by a grand jury who gets to hear the evidence against you. Yeah, uh, throwing around this term probable cause constantly, uh, it's just like throwing around the term the, um, the Commerce Clause. You know, the federal government likes to use the Commerce Clause to say they can basically control whether or not you salivate in the morning. Um, that's a vulgar uh, description, but uh, uh, yeah, you know, it's always probable cause, you know. Oh, you know, uh, you drove by, I smelled weed in your car. Handcuffs searching you and searching your car, you know. I mean, that's just a, an example. Whereas that, un uh, under the Constitution, what the officer would have to do would go to a judge 
the judge would have to decide whether the information the officer presented was enough to issue a warrant for the arrest. And then the officer would have to go back to the person and go, hey, you know, I smelled weed and I want to uh, search your vehicle or search your person. And then if he had your permission. Yes, and if you didn't give him your permission. You said no, that didn't mean, that's, oh, you. That stopped it. Because they say a lot, you know, well, well you know, the, uh, the assailant or whatever they, you know, whatever terminology I always use. Perpetrator. Know, perpetrator. Uh, refused to let me search them, and so I was uh, suspicious, and that gave me probable cause. Eh, wrong. The purpose but of government is to protect sense. life and property. That's it, life and property. If you're not having your property stolen or your life threatened, then the government has no right to step into the business. And the government only has, an, uh, only has a mandate to intervene if somebody else claims that you are threatening their their property or their life you know that there has actually been an injury committed they have to testify to the policeman that you injured them yet almost all of the people that go to court today have no injury the plaintiff in the case has not sworn that they have injured them but they have violated some uh, victimless crime type situation you know I mean smoking marijuana is a victimless crime nobody got hurt there and there's no injured party so how do you get a warrant for somebody's arrest when they haven't injured anybody how do you testify that somebody injured somebody which is the definition of a crime a crime is you injured somebody if you didn't injure them, then no crime was committed. So now we're going to move on to the Fifth Amendment, Criminal Proceedings and Condemnation of Property, Section 1. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime, capital would be murder, unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury except in cases arising in the land or naval forces, in other words in the military, or in the militia, when in actual service in time of war or public danger. Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. Why don't we tell that to the IRS who, you know, if they lose their case against you one year, they'll come back against you the next year and they'll call it, well, it's a completely different case because it's a completely different year. Yeah, sure. <laughs> That's nor, not common sense. <laughs> nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. In other words, you can't testify. So when the officer pulls you over and says, what's your name? I can take the Fifth Amendment and not give it to you. Plus, a name confers ownership. So when they're asking you what your name is and you tell them, not only are you giving yourself over to jurisdiction by answering their question uh, as though they have power and control over you, you're also conferring that uh, somewhere in the documentation that states your name, such as at the DMV or at the Department of uh, State or whatever, or you know, uh, where those records are kept, uh, you know, it confers that there's a, an ownership relationship with the state and you as a, a flesh and blood man or woman. Yes, because without your name and date of birth and address, they can't charge the legal fiction, which is your name in all capital letters, which is the only thing that those public policies that they create called codes applies to. Because a corporation can charge another corporation, but a corporation has no hands to write, no eyes to see, no soul to breathe. So uh, it cannot charge or, or bring uh, charges against uh, a living, breathing, flesh and blood man or woman. A corporation cannot take its rules and apply them to living things. It can only take its rules and apply them to other fictions, other corporations, other companies, you know, incorporated, etc. Nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And that well, goes back to the, uh, you know, the, it's interesting the way the amendments are set up because that like bounces you right back to the fourth, due process, you know. <laughs> yes, due process means you have to have been served and you have to have an opportunity to defend yourself. Now let's say your tags on your car are six months old. They come and tow your car. Is your car your property? You won't find a single policeman who will argue that your car does not belong to you. 
and yet right there they're taking away your property without due process. Due process means that you have an opportunity to go to court and and complain about it and defend your rights. Or at least that you have an opportunity that they sent you something in the mail and you have an opportunity to object to it. You don't have any opportunity to object. There's no due process. They just come and take the car immediately. They a take your property. They steal it. Which is a complete violation of the Fifth Amendment. And that's why knowing these things gives you a position of power because knowledge is power. But I like what Einstein, I believe it was Einstein said that imagination was more important than knowledge but uh, I would have to say that I like that comment and I believe to a certain extent it's true but uh, having gained the knowledge about common law and constitutionalism beyond what I was taught in school has definitely brought me to a place where I feel that knowledge is extremely important at this point. <laughs> yes, the pen is mightier than the sword or the yeah. gun. I mean, learn, imagine, you know, I mean, I used to be one of these people who just thought there was no course. That was it, you know. I mean, I, I have to accept that this is it. This is the system, and there's nothing I can do. And all I have, to, all I can do is, you know, whine, bitch, and otherwise just, you know, go to work every day and just follow the crowd at chow time, and I'll never be free. And uh, how sad, you know. Well, I came to realize that that is not true. <laughs> nor shall any private property be taken for public use without just compensation. And that's where they get into eminent domain. If they feel that, uh, that they need to put a bridge in across the river and your property is in the way of where they want to put the bridge, they have, they have a right under eminent domain to take your property. Well, but there's they, the Commerce Clause again. Also. But they have to pay you for it. However, They've come to the position now where a couple years back on the East Coast, some uh, pharmaceutical company decided that the land around a certain area was, uh, was excellent and they went in and forced everybody in the area to sell their houses and the city, you know, by eminent domain, took their property and gave it to a private company, not for public use, a private company for, on the, with the idea that they could, it would be a benefit to the community because they would make more money in taxes every year from the corporation than they would from the individual ta uh, homeowners. So uh, also, in terms of uh, theft of property through this eminent domain and all the, you know, seizure of property, property without due process, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you uh, folks out there in the La La Land remember, uh, that in uh, New Orleans uh, after Katrina, there was a huge uh, center uh, of the uh, quarter, the French quarter, um, where there was uh, some public housing. Now the government had wanted this as a prime spot for commercial property and they wanted it for a long time but couldn't get it because there was a bunch of pesky people living there. Poor uh, people. Poor people, exactly, uh, who were, um, uh, they live in their skin, so I should say they're all domiciled there. and. Uh, that area was not hit by any devastation that uh, would would uh, see that uh, neighborhood shut down as a danger zone of being a hazard. Anyway, they uh, those people still never got to go back into their homes, and the government is basically uh, the, the the privatized government uh, has basically claimed that property for their own. Okay, let's read Amendment Six. This is the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments in the United States Constitution mode of trial in criminal proceedings section one in all criminal proceedings the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed which district shall have been previously ascertained by law and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation uh, i'd like to point out that when they say a speedy trial, they mean that they, you can't let too much time go by because if you let too much time go by, what happens to people that witnessed the event? I mean, three months later, they still might have a fairly good recollection of what they witnessed, but two years later, that would be hard. I, list, I read a court case where somebody in California had been arrested, and they didn't charge him and bring him to trial for four and a half years. And he made the argument that, you know, some of the people that he knew at the time that had witnessed the thing, he was not, you know, 
very, you know, extremely good friends with, but might have known their first name only, and he would not be able to track them down at this point to give testimony. And the courts argued that uh, no, four and a half years was not too long for a speedy trial and that the rules of speedy trial weren't violated. I think it all comes back to the the common law um, golden rule. Is this really how you would want to be treated? I mean, if the judge was uh, hit with some kind of uh, complaint and then they didn't do anything about it and four and a half years later they decided to bring charges, would he really want to be in a situation where he couldn't defend himself? No, nobody would be. And yet, that's just how out of whack our system is today. To be confronted with the witnesses against him, so you have a right to face those that are accusing you. And what happens in courts today where the uh, plaintiff is, uh, is the people of the state of California, do you have a right to face them? I mean, there is nobody that's complaining about you. It's the police officer, but the real um, complainant is the people of the state of California. And you, ha and you can't uh, face them and ask them questions. So you've been denied that right. And this is because at the revolution when the country was formed and the Constitution was passed, the state didn't bring people to charge. It was, you know, the neighbor, the farmer, the businessman. These were the only people that brought charges against you, so you had a right to face the person who was bringing the charges. And you have the right to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Now, you have the right to obtain witnesses because you can still get a subpoena and have the people that you need to testify, even if they don't want to be there, to uh, have to show up and testify. But do you have the right to have assistance of counsel? The word counsel has been defined in Webster's Dictionary as somebody who gives advice. And of the ten definitions for counsel in Webster's Dictionary in 18, yeah, I think it was 1828 Webster's Dictionary, the last definition out of ten listed a lawyer as counselor. Not counsel, but counselor. And if you think that they didn't have a word for attorney or lawyer back in that, uh, in 1828, Actually, they did. So when they picked words to use in the Constitution, they didn't pick them willy-nilly. The people that wrote the Constitution were extremely intelligent people, you know, a very high level of education, way past a couple, you know, four years of college. These guys were very well read, and they picked each word. Sorry, pardon me. Americans need to pay income tax only if they choose to volunteer their payment. Volunteer, folks and the IRS itself states that the tax is voluntary. However, if an IRS Form 1040 is signed because we have been intimidated to believe we must do so, then we have signed a contract stating that we volunteer to pay the IRS said sum, waiving our Fifth Amendment rights. Well, we just got into the Fifth Amendment, so I thought it appropriate to bring up that the signing Form 1040 actually violates your Fifth Amendment. Yeah, if you can be put in jail, yourself. if you can be put in jail for testifying falsely on it, then you don't have to falsely incriminate yourself, do you? Exactly. So the Internal Revenue Service routinely uh, ignores substantive and procedural uh, due, due process rights secured by the Constitution and laws of the United States. IRS personnel encumber property with more, with mere notices of lien, which have been fraudulently transferred by the county recorders into the lien indexes of their counties. They then seize everything up to and including wages, bank accounts, automobiles, and homes without court orders, authoring encumbrance and seizure. So again, no due process, violations of the Fifth well, Amendment, actually, Fourth Amendment, actually, it goes on and on. their argument is that they did use due process. And the point is, the due process that they used was they sent you a letter. And yeah. they said that you owe us the money. And if you don't respond within uh, 30 days, then it's true. And you took that letter and go, I don't know what I can do about this. I must owe the money. Yeah, I forgot to pay. And yeah, I did this and I did that. <laughs> and instead of um, putting the ball back in their court and saying, you know, I'll accept that I owe you money based on your proof of claim that, you know, that I have a debt to you. Prove your claim. Prove that I have a liability and show me where that liability came from. Is there some kind of contract that I signed that I've walked out on? Is there, 
Did I steal money from you? I mean, they have to prove their claim. You have a right to know the nature and the cause. We just read that. We have the right to know the nature and the cause of any charges against us. So what's the nature? Where did this liability come from? I need to know, and I need you to tell me. So even though they're claiming a due process by sending you the form and having tacit agreement, they still are in dishonor of the Constitution. You know, just, just, by, uh, just by wording things the way they word them and then putting a gun to your head and telling you uh, 1040 or jail, uh, you know, uh, you know, so incriminate yourself, violate the Fifth Amendment, you know, and then if things go their way and not yours, they do uh, seize property and they do uh, put it in, into their lien index and uh, they do it without due process, there's no judge's orders, etc. You know, the IRS acts as pretty much an independent agency, which makes sense since they are an independent agency, anyway. So, uh, yes, yeah, since nobody challenges them, that's just, uh, then they get to roll right ahead with whatever they want to do. So now let's go on to the Seventh Amendment. And here we have the Seventh Amendment trial by jury, section one. In suits at common law, and you know, at the time in the revolutionary era, almost every suit that ever existed was in common law. There was only four forms of law, common law, equity, admiralty, and maritime. And unless you were on sea, you wouldn't be an admiralty or maritime, so you would have to be an equity or common law. Equity is where they have a series of uh, rules. You know, they're going to use statutes and codes, and you know, you have to abide by these little, um, you know, legislated acts that they produce. And equity, chiefly at the time, at that time, was for mortgages and, uh, you know, financial instruments. It was more had to do with money. I mean, you have equity in your house, right, if you've been paying into it for a number of years. And equity is, wasn't a, a very common form of law. So you have in suits at common law where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. So, how often today are decisions that are made by courts overturned? I mean, well, not courts, juries. A jury decides to free somebody and they come right back and uh, some judge will overturn that decision. That's because the juries that are today are not common law juries and the court action isn't a common law action. So. Well, unfortunately, people also aren't uh, educated about uh, fully informed jury and in that they don't have to follow the uh, law as the judge gives it to them. What judges like to uh, juries, uh, among other things, is that uh, you must follow the laws I give it to you. And also, there could be uh, legal ramifications and penalties, and you could get in trouble if you rule improperly. This is another form of intimidation.